Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hey, me again, Jeff. Welcome to Journeys. Glad that you're tuning in. Uh, and remember, uh, everybody, Kate, there's some of you people out there that think that your story or your journey is mundane or not worth uh, sharing. Uh, that's a big mistake. Everybody has a very poignant story to tell. Call the station. Let us know if you're interested in sharing your story. And uh, we, would, we would love to hear from you. Today we have a, a guest, uh, a very uh, interesting person. Uh, welcome to the show, Yitzhak Adler. Yes, good to be here. Nice to have you here. Tell Thank us you. about, we're, we're, tell us about your story. You, to your story is... Uh, is the you know centerpiece of our show today? Where were you born? Very, very good, thank you. I was actually born in in New York City. Uh, my parents uh, were both born in Germany, pre World War II, and because of the Holocaust and events that took place in Europe at that time, uh, they both came to the United States. They didn't know each other at the time. My mom's family was more visionary than my dad's family and they came to New York in the late 1930s. My father's family was not as fortunate. More of them perished in the Holocaust, but uh, my mom's family did make it to New York and that's where they met after the war. And I lived there until I was three. And then my dad got a job actually in Connecticut, in West Haven. And our family lived in West Haven till I was nine. When I was nine, they, my dad got a job in Atlanta. My family moved to Atlanta, and they never looked back. To this day, my brothers live in Atlanta, my mom lives in Atlanta, my dad, who passed away a few years ago, is buried there. And other than the 22 years that I've lived here, I consider Atlanta home. How was it living in Atlanta when you were a young boy? Uh back was was there uh, any issues with any clash with the the, the southern georgia Rem people and and you're being jewish was that a problem remember i w i was 9 when i moved down to atlanta and too young to be aware of of any of those social rumblings and uh, changes that were taking place i went to public school and it was a fine fine experience rural schools, mind you. Uh, I say Atlanta, but we actually lived e outside of Atlanta in a small town called Decatur. And I do remember, Jeff, that uh, my brothers and I were the only Jewish kids in that particular elementary school. And uh, ironically, the year I was in fifth grade, I had a Jewish teacher who was the only Jewish teacher in that school. And wow. she, I remember my folks invited her to come to our home for a Passover Seder. And it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. It was nice. I still remember it fondly. So being a, being a young Jewish boy in Atlanta was not, uh, it was not a, a painful childhood. It I, was, it was Jeff, I can tell you that throughout my life, look back on it, I do not remember ever, thank heavens, being a victim of any form of anti-Semitism or prejudice. It just hasn't been a fact in my life. I bet your parents and family probably had some pretty harrowing things to tell about 1930s Germany. Oh yeah, hey, my um, dad, my dad was in the last kinder transport to get young people out of Germany and out of harm's way. My dad was separated from his parents for for many years. They eventually were able to get to the United States, but my dad's been part of the war in Holland. As a matter of fact, my dad was hiding 
on the same street as Anne Frank at the same time she was there. My dad made it fortuitously wow. to England where he spent several years until legislation was passed in Washington during the war that made it possible under very specific and strict guidelines for family reunification. When my dad was 18, he was able to come to the United States. He was reuni re reunified with his parents, but after a very short amount of time, he, he had to enlist in the United States Navy, did his basic training down in Mississippi and spent the last two years of the war in the South Pacific, a petty officer on the uh, aircraft carrier Saratoga. How have these experiences that your, your parents, your family had, and your own, some of your own experiences, what have, have they taught you about, about just you know, the anti-Semitism, prejudice, racism, um, uh, bigotry? What, what, have, what, have, what, have, what, what valuable lessons have you taken from, from this? Well, like I mentioned, I don't feel that in my lifetime I have been victimized by those vices, but the history of the Jewish people is full of chapters where because of the way Judaism practices religion, our people have been victims and it's the lessons that my parents taught me and the lessons that I have extracted and all Jews have extracted from our spiritual history that fosters a sensitivity and awareness and a certain modern liberalism that recognizes the dignity of every human being, the image of God that we believe is in every human being, and our commitment to what in Judaism we call tikkun olam, to make the world a better place. We use our own experiences and the truth is, Jeff, whether an individual suffers a direct act of discrimination or, or spiritual violence or whether it's something that's part of his or her past, both should have bearing on how we look at the world and our partnerships with God to make this world a better place for all people. Very, very, very good sentiments. Very important to, to keep those things in mind. Okay, let's go back to Atlanta. Your, uh, what, what happened after school, after high school? Where'd you go to college? Oh, Did I, I, didn't, I didn't finish high school in Atlanta. I can't explain how, but I knew when I was 12 years old that I wanted to become a rabbi. And the year after my bar mitzvah, when I was 14, finishing eighth grade in Atlanta, my parents met with our congregational rabbi and discussed this expectation I had of myself. And he encouraged my parents to allow me to pursue that dream, even though I was really too young to know of a certainty what I would want to do with my life. But nonetheless, things happen for all sorts of reasons. I left home at the age of 14 to attend a Jewish high school because there was no Jewish high school in Atlanta. I actually graduated from high school in Memphis, Tennessee, which was the closest school to Atlanta at the time that was offering those kinds of studies. And after I graduated high school, I continued in Memphis, which at the time was the only rabbinical seminary in the South. And I also attended classes at what was then Memphis State University. Now it's known as the University of Memphis. And I got my degrees from the University of Memphis in 1976 and got my ordination in 1977 and began my career. And you, you, where did you begin your career? Well, until I came to West Hartford in 1995, I had a claim to fame that was worth about this much, but nonetheless a claim to fame that I was the only practicing rabbi in the United States who was raised in the South, educated in the South, and practicing in the South. Wow. Uh, my first position was as a youth director at a very large and successful synagogue in Savannah, Georgia. After two years there, I went to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I had my first pulpit 
a, a small congregation that was rebuilding, as a matter of fact, from a bombing. The same year that I started my career in Savannah, the synagogue in Chattanooga, Tennessee, had been bombed. The building was destroyed. And when I was ready to move on from Savannah, Chattanooga had rebuilt itself to the point that it was ready to hire a rabbi. And that was my first pulpit. Went there in um, 1979, congregation of about 30 families. And I stayed there for five years. When I left, it was a congregation of about 75 families and moved to Jacksonville, Florida. And I served in Jacksonville from 1984 until 1995. And it was wonderful. Jacksonville was a wonderful place to live. I tell people that when I came to Connecticut, I traded in a lawnmower for a snowblower. <laughs> but as our family was growing, we had three kids. Um, we felt that their needs, their educational needs, were not being adequately met by the resources available to us in Jacksonville. We needed to move to a larger Jewish community. And with the grace of heaven, the position was available in West Hartford, and it was considered a plum. This is considered a very, very nice place to raise a Jewish family. And fortunately, Beth David hired me as a rabbi, and I've been here now for 22 years. And your kids are all, I guess they're grown up by now. Well, you know, in, in the eyes of a parent, kids never are fully grown up, but we have three married children. Our eldest um, is married, lives in Fairlawn, New Jersey, has three kids. Our middle one, our daughter there, lives in Israel. She has three kids. And, and our youngest is our son, who was most recently married and lives with his wife in Queens. And they went to, were they Hall High? Did they, uh, no, the, Connor? All, or? all three of them graduated elementary school from the Hebrew Academy in Bloomfield. Oh. They all three graduated from Hebrew High School of New England in West Hartford. Our, our eldest uh, graduated from Stern College, which is a division of Yeshiva University in New York, and then got a graduate degree in social work from the Wurzweiler School. Our middle one actually moved to Israel, made Aliyah, became an Israeli citizen, uh, went to college there at Bar Ilan University, and got her graduate degree at a place called uh, Machon Hadassah. She practices as an optometrist. And our son got a business degree at Yeshiva University, and he is now working in the metro New York area. Wow, very good. Yeah, we think good, so. Good parenting there. What, uh, what's the... It's not only the parenting, it's good kids too. Well, that's true. And, and one, one affects the other. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you certainly uh, have an influence. Parents certainly have a big influence on, the, on, their, on their kids. Uh, more than a lot of people realize, as I tried mm -hmm. to impress upon the parents of kids that I taught in Hartford, mm -hmm. um, just generally speaking, all adults, whether they're parents or whether you're brothers or sisters or uncles or just neighbors or teachers or coaches, you're interacting with kids. Um, you're, 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 you're making a big, big impression on them. Kids, kids are very astute observers. Mm -hmm. um, well, what, what, all the stuff that you've done, uh, Rabbi Adler, what's the hardest thing? Is there one particular obstacle that was very difficult for you to overcome in your life? That's hard to say. In a moment, Jeff, any obstacle can seem hard. Any challenge can be daunting. And I'd probably be less than honest to say that there weren't those times in my life that I had to scratch my head and ask myself, what am I doing? Why and am I going to accomplish everything I want to? But you work with perseverance, dedication, commitment, keep your eye on the target. And most of the time, you either get the goal you are pursuing or with good fortune and hard work, you find a goal that you find satisfying. So for all of your experiences and all of the reading and studying and all of the people with whom you have interacted in your life, is there one basic overriding fundamental strong belief that you've come away with 
and sure. And it may sound corny, but I believe it is essential. And that is to take every person you meet in life seriously. A little bit like social workers say, meet a person where he or she needs to be met. Don't take anything for granted. Every person that walks into the synagogue is as valued at a time of worship or study as everybody else, whether that person is a newcomer or an old timer. And as long as we treat people with that sense of respect, then we will earn respect and we will achieve the mission of making the world a better place. So when you're, when you're going about your business and your travels and you see a, you happen to spy a person who's wheeling a, a shopping cart full of bottles to the, the store or somebody rummaging through a, um, through a uh, dumpster or somebody on the corner with a brown paper bag, or some buddy homeless person. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? What's your first thought? My first thought is, thank heavens it's not me. Therefore, but the grace of God go I. Yes. And my second thought is, God bless that person. Because even people whose lives are more difficult and in certain ways downtrodden can find meaning by initiative and pursuit. And those people that are going down the streets and checking the dumpsters are, are in line ahead of me at the grocery store to redeem those bottles and get their nickels. And that's how they pay for their groceries. And if that's the way that destiny and fate has determined they will support themselves, then I owe them my respect and I owe them my support. How do you respond to somebody who says, I know why that person is homeless or destitute um, because they're irresponsible, they were lazy, it's their own fault, and it's none of my responsibility. What would you say to a person who, who, who uh, said that? I would probably quote the book of Genesis where Sarah said to her husband Abraham, let the Lord be the judge between thee and me. God did not put us here to be judges upon each other. God put us here to create a, a human community, to help when we can. And sometimes, Jeff, sometimes the best help is tough love. But even tough love is not judgment. We don't judge each other. That's not why God put us here. I think it's a natural human effort to try to create concrete images in our minds of just about everything we cope yeah, with. Right. It's not that we have anthropomorphized God, though there's no doubt in my mind that the early monotheists did. That's pretty clear from ancient texts. But the way rabbinics looks at it is that religion speaks to humanity in human terms because those are the terms that we can comprehend. But, before, but because the Torah uses humanistic terms to describe God does not make God humanistic. God is amorphous, but we cannot relate to amorphous concepts. We cannot visualize amorphous concepts. Therefore, Bible uses personifications to help us gain a handle and a relationship with. Do, do you think one of the problematic aspects of that is that that the intent, this is, is, is from, from your take, is, mm -hmm. is, to, is to regard these as personifications, um, in other words, um, figurative kind of language. Do you think that so, only, it's only for purposes of the frame of reference. Okay. It's not to create a god with a white beard and a yeah. big stick and a pen and a book and of an life. angry and a bad temper and all that stuff. That's only for our purposes. But do you think do you think that 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 that, the, that one of the gone off 
that what's gone awry or whatever is that is that rather is a in a contrary to to, to what your con conceptualization is a lot of people out there regard this as this not as a as a figurative personification but literally they take it literally do you think that's led to uh, problems uh, it's led to in our if, if people human history are, if people are taking the text literally they're not using the text accurately uh -huh. and whenever a text is used in a way beyond its original intent then the result can be held as a fault of the text so 21 years you've been the, the rabbi Tell us, tell us a little bit about your, your congregation and your work and uh, what is it, uh, kind of on a daily basis, just briefly, what, uh, what does a rabbi do? Uh, with the, you're not just giving sermons on, a, on, a, on the Sabbath. You're actively involved in other things during the week with, with your congregation. What are some of the things that you do? Yeah, a lot of folks want to know, what do you do all day? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I got to tell you, number one, it's a privilege to be the rabbi of Beth David Synagogue, which is a landmark congregation in this community. It's on Farmington Avenue. Thousands of people pass the synagogue every day, going and coming. And, and it speaks to the heritage and commitment that the Jewish community has here in West Hartford. West Hartford is a strong Jewish community, and whether it's town council or in other ways, it's always been working. Jews in this community have been working for the welfare and for the well-being of the entire Jewish community. What does a rabbi do all day? Well, at Beth David, we have services, prayers, every morning, 6.30 in the morning, sunrise services. We have services every evening around sunset. And those services need to be led, we need to make sure that there's a quorum of worshipers so that all the proper prayers can be said. Independent of Sabbath sermons, which are of course essential. There are classes that take place at different times of the week and for different age groups. We have five or six classes at Beth David every week, and those classes need to be prepared. People are being born, people are getting ill, people's lives are ending. There are all of these life cycle events that are benefited from clergy involvement, pastoral counseling, celebrations, helping people mourn, getting people through the difficult times of unemployment, other challenges. If a rabbi, or for that matter, any clergy, really takes the tasks seriously, it is, without joking, more than a full-time job. No, that sounds like it. Oh, what, what's your, do you have, um, is there anything that you have on the front burner in tr terms of, uh, your next goal, or your, any, any, uh, any aspirations do you see? What do you envision a little bit further down the road for what you would like to, what you would like to work on? Where would you like to direct your, your energy and your efforts? Well, as you can well appreciate, inertia is not an energy that any of us can take for granted. And therefore, it's the responsibility of a rabbi or the spiritual leader probably of any congregation to make sure that the congregation stays vibrant, stays socially healthy, and that it perpetuates itself from generation to generation. And it's been a privilege, as I mentioned, to be the rabbi at Beth David for all these years. And right now I wanna make sure that the congregation continues to grow, to be vibrant, to be healthy, so that all the good things that we've been able to to deliver to our community will be able to be continued to be delivered going forward. Very good. You know, you told me a few before the show started, and I want to. I think this is something that's important to mention. Um, you said that you her you will very shortly be working with the. You're right across the street from the St. Thomas Church, the Catholic yes, Church. Yes. And the, what is there, the head priest, or I don't know, what, what's the title? The senior clergy there is a Father Moran. Father Moran. Now, you and Father Moran are going to collaborate. F 
Father Moran and I have been something. collaborating for for more than a, <coughs> more than a year now. Do we? If you what? drive down Farmington Avenue, you'll notice in the front yard of the synagogue, there's a, there's a community garden called Jesse's Garden, and that is an quote unquote where we'd say an urban garden where volunteers from our synagogue and from the Catholic Church get together. They take care of that garden. They raise vegetables throughout the summer together, and those vegetables then go to food pantries and shelters downtown to help feed hungry and homeless people. So the collaboration between the synagogue and the church is already a multi-year enterprise. But Father Moran and I have, um, it hasn't even been work, it's, it's been pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. We get together on a regular basis and we talk as colleagues and as friends, sometimes about scripture, sometimes about the challenges we have in our careers. And of course, by the time this show airs, it'll already be history, but he and I will be completing this evening a two-part series where we are team teaching biblical text. A couple of weeks ago, more than 100 people gathered at St. Thomas from our two congregations, and we, we shared different theologies that our respective faiths extract from a particular chapter in the book of Genesis. And this evening, Beth David is the host, and we're going to team teach from the book of Psalms to show, to build a bridge, to demonstrate that ancient holy texts can have lessons and values to multiple faiths. And there's no reason to be at odds with each other, but rather strengthen the community and individual lives through partnerships. That's true ecumenicalist thinking. Uh, what, what along those lines, what do you think would you say is the common denominator that 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 is infused in all the re the Abrahamic religions, other religions, other uh, um, texts, religious texts, and so on. Is there a common denominator that that goes through all of? They all have in common. What would you say that is? Well, if we focus on the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, then we go to the role modeling and the personalities of Abraham, Sarah, and their families. And we find that their lives were, were punctuated, hallmarked, guided by principles like kindness, compassion, justice, honesty, and a belief in God. And those are profound principles. They are timeless principles. And when we build upon those principles, even in the 21st century, what we do is we take down barriers, we build bridges, we strengthen societies, and we empower people who are willing to grow to be biblical even in our lifetimes towards making the world, making society better for everyone. And, and to remember that the bumper sticker is great Think globally, act locally. It's not about what somebody will do in Washington or New York or Jerusalem. It's about what do we do here, even in a small community like West Hartford. What can we do here that makes a difference here? And the more that happens in the here of West Hartford and this town and that town, wherever people live, it doesn't need an act of legislation and an international capital. What happens locally is what changes the world. I wish we could broadcast what you just said all over the world because it's, uh, it really, really is very important for people to be reminded of that and to hear that. I uh, want to thank you for being with us. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Rabbi Adler, and thank you people out there. And remember, everybody, that person who's homeless, that person who's going through the dumpster, that person who dropped out of high school, they have stories to tell, very important, poignant stories that can hopefully stir everybody's compassion and capable, capability of love and understanding where other people are coming from and what makes us all tick as human beings. So thank you very much. Hope to see you guys next time. Call up. Call us up. Bye-bye.
Thank you.